good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us. Betsy and I are happy to share Rural Studios and Front Porch Initiatives work with you. I'll begin uh, with an explanation. Uh, you can, yep, there we go. I'll begin with an explanation of who we are and give you a description of what it's like to be a student here at Rural Studio. Betsy's going to go over our collaboration, uh, Rural Studios collaboration with Front Porch Initiative and uh, talk about the lessons that they're learning from monitoring the performance of the houses that uh, their group has built. Um, Rural Studio is a design build program, which is part of the architecture program at Auburn University. We're a fully immersive program and based in rural West Alabama. So think of us uh, like a study abroad program in our home state. Next slide, yeah. So we're uh, fiercely place-based. That's our number one characteristic. Uh, Auburn's main campus is on the, located about three hours east of us. And so our students move out to Hale County to participate. Our main office is in New Bern, which is a little town of about 300 people. And our service area rests, rests within a 25 mile radius of that home base. Rural Studios started uh, you know, over 27 years ago by building unique homes for single families. Initially, the homes, uh, we didn't, the design process really didn't focus on replicability or affordability. And the materials that we used, like old sidewalk pieces, and that's what you're seeing in that little building in the foreground there, or carpet tiles or hay had little value until we assigned them a value. And we were probably using those inexpensive materials because we couldn't afford much else in the beginning of our, um, of when we were first started. So in addition to housing, our students also design and build projects uh, for community organizations. The Newburn Library, like the image that you're looking at there, is an example of giving a new life to a cornerstone building in a small community. It focuses on education, and uh, this, state, this state library is, uh, all, also offers the only high-speed internet in the area. Science Park is a multi-year project, over 10 years worth of projects in this particular park, offers outdoor recreation opportunities to community members and which promotes health in the area. We look for organizations already doing great things in our area to support, like the Boys and Girls Club here of Greensboro. We've actually built three Boys and Girls Clubs in our 27 years. And programs like these provide invaluable after-school programs for the kids in our town. Uh, but we're a housing and food first organizations, the way we think of ourselves. Our student built greenhouse in this image and working, working vegetable farm help us understand the challenges of accessing fresh food in rural areas. And we share, we all share in the responsibility of growing food. The students work on our farm early in the morning. Uh, so we build together and we eat together. Um, it, that greenhouse is, you know, I won't get into it too much, but it's a passive greenhouse. It, those water, those barrels are uh, filled with water and they act as a thermal mass to help keep the little plants warm in the winter time. But, but uh, so, well, we believe that proper food and housing are the bedrock to a sustainable community. These basic necessities lie at the heart of Rural Studios' mission. Our almost 30 years in West Alabama, we've discovered community sustainability. It's, kind of like a web. So for example, when residents weren't able to get homeowners insurance in their community because there wasn't a local volunteer fire department, they started a volunteer fire station on their own. They applied for a grant and won it and were able to purchase this brand new fire station. Uh, and But they didn't have a place to put the fire truck. So Rural Studio worked with the town to build this new firehouse in town hall. A fire station makes homeowners insurance possible, which makes financing possible, which makes building a house that's titled as real property possible. So it's like a web. And then this, of course, leads me back to housing, uh, which is the focus of this presentation, high performance, the high performance housing that we design and build in uh, West Alabama and now in the region. So Hell County lies in one of the most impoverished areas in our country. Uh, we're in Hale County, but Perry County is right next door, and Marengo County. Those are our three main counties. And, um, you know, folks that live here are 
living at or below the national line of poverty are you know over 25 percent in our particular county and before the house trailer which is really common now uh small well-used homes like this i call this a well-used home um where our are, are common site and you can still see stick built uh older homes like this but the truth is these days it's much easier to get a new a note like a car note for a used new used or new trailer such as this and the problem with this type of home is that it depreciates in value they're not particularly efficient as you probably know and they have about a 15 year life expectancy even though you typically get a 30 year note to purchase one. So most of our clients own their property, uh, but they don't really have the means to build a house on it. And it's actually kind of hard to find someone to build a house around here. Uh, so the most affordable option is in fact, not affordable at all. Um, and this reality has helped us shift our efforts from individual solutions like the hay bell house that you saw in the beginning of the presentation for individual families to prototype research and development. And this is an example of one of those houses, Joanne's house. Um, the 20K house is an ongoing research project to develop well-designed affordable houses that support an industry of home building across the rural South. The project seeks to create dignified houses that make responsible home ownership a possibility for everybody. The academic and research programs at Rural Studio create a loop between thinking and practice. On the academic side, where I work, students develop new prototypes and refine existing ones. These designs are studied and further refined by the team at the Front Porch Initiative, where uh, Betsy McKenzie worked. But before Betsy explains that work, I'm going to describe the principles behind the 20K house and some examples of student designed homes. In 17 years, over 25 different prototypes of 20K houses have been built. Typically, they're designed without a client in mind or without a site. They will be built for a client, but because they are a prototype, um, the designing without a client in mind or without a particular site allows the students to concentrate on a specific uh, design programs for that particular project. Um, so, but however different, the, each of those houses, each of those prototypes share nine core qualities. The essential criteria, which we think all buildings should really have are durability, buildability, water resistance, and security. Uh, these, you know, these characteristics are nothing new. But in addition to the core criteria, 20K houses also possess or have uh, presence and dignity. They foster a sense of community, which is usually expressed through a front porch. They promote health and wellness with access to daylight, fresh air, and we use healthy materials, and they provide comfort to the homeowner. And 20K houses are accommodating to age and accessibility. And uh, they also all should possess a sense of craft. We are an architecture school. That's our number one, um, you know, our number one goal is to teach architecture students how to make better buildings. Uh, and so, you know, just because it doesn't cost a lot of money doesn't mean it can't be beautiful. So they're, um, they're also crafted well. For the students, collaboration is key at Rural Studio. We start by drawing on the same piece of paper. Uh, this is my class a few years ago. We have a day long charrette where, you know, at every 45 seconds, a new idea is represented on a piece of paper and then it's pinned on a wall where we're able to start collecting ideas and seeing where our similarities overlap. Um, the, the house designs aren't predetermined and we never vote and we don't pick, I don't pick what they build. Uh, we all work, including me, uh, to gain consensus by sharing ideas and finding similarities and contributing to the group. We all have to agree on what to build. It's very important. It's not an easy process. It's pretty painful, but um, we do it. And then, uh, and then I start each semester with what I call a sawhorse race. Uh, students design and build a set of sawhorses with a set list of materials. They build one set. Um, we test them. And then we usually, we fix them. And sometimes we have to disassemble them or scrap them because they don't work. 
But this early assignment familiarizes them with the building materials that we'll be using for the house and also associates, they begin to make associations with performance testing to understand that everything they make and build uh, serves a purpose and should be tested. Uh, so, and we get to use sawhorses during construction, of course. Uh, and in my studio, particularly, we build a house for a community member each year. And it's paid through for, um, it's paid through by grants and donations. So it's a gift uh, to the homeowner for having to deal with us for over a year. Um, and, but when we aren't designing a new prototype, we work to refine the ones that we already have in our portfolio. Uh, for the younger students who I teach, we study one bedroom prototypes and we call these the product line homes. And we pick one to build for uh, the client and for the property. So the design is in understanding the client and the property and also different building assemblies. That's the design project for the younger students. And we learn about every aspect of the home. These are sketch up models where I, the students turn two dimensional construction documents into piece by piece sketch up models to understand the buildability of these houses. And they're really good examples of stick frame construction and basic advanced enclosures. These aren't, this is pretty basic stuff, but we, we try to do things the right way in an affordable manner. The first goal of refining a prototype is testing new assembly ideas. In this study that's on your screen, we looked at how using a slab on grade foundation, which has many benefits over a peer foundation, uh, would affect the architecture. It might perform better, but it might change the architecture. And we need to understand these things. So we study alternative foundations, wall assemblies, porch configurations, cladding options, lots of variations that, we, that um, my students study. And we draw a lot at Rural Studio. We, we draw a lot by hand. These full scale sections that I had students draw uh, help them to understand the magnitude of the project, scale of the home, and the details of construction. It was probably the biggest architectural pinup in history, but we have fun doing it. It's the, one of the most important parts of uh, our work. And drawing it full, drawing it full scale, is really helpful to understanding how uh, a building goes together. Um, and we also study existing buildings. We we study what works and what doesn't. We have we. We go back and visit what we've um, built and uh, we try to understand what didn't work. Um, let's see, real buildings and real clients are really the, the most two important aspects of Rural Studio. Working with a client is a, an invaluable opportunity for an architecture student. Um, the second goal of refining the prototype is to allow the client to push back on the prototype. So what I mean is that students learn about the life of their client and make changes or alter the prototype to suit them. And what we hope is that because these prototypes were designed in, in a vacuum, essentially, without a client, this is a way for the client to influence the prototype in small ways. Um, and this process usually begins with very, very careful renderings of the existing home. I call these empathetic drawings. Um, and through these very careful studies and time-consuming renderings, we begin to understand and love uh, what's important to our client. So for example, this is Ree's, uh, my client, her name is Ree. This is her original trailer home. She lived in it for 42 years, which is a long time for someone to take care of a trailer home. Um, but uh, so Ree's truck is rendered in this drawing and the proximity of, of it to the front door is what's important. We learned that knee, uh, that Re has knee troubles and was parking as close as she could to her front door because it was easier for her. So this translated into a fully accessible entrance to the new house, um, which helped us understand how to incorporate a ramp into one of the, pro the product line homes. So students illustrate their ideas in lots of ways and present them to classmates and to the client when it's appropriate. We have an incredible lineup of consultants that help us with all our projects, uh, code consultants, engineers, architects, landscape architects, and uh, others visit us for reviews. And our students do very real drawings also. No hammer is swung on a site without a set of drawings. 
Uh, scheduling is also handled uh, as a group with a modified full planning session. We divide, I divide students into expertise teams that represent construction trades and we, we schedule out the project. But the real work happens on the site. The very, the, you know, the very real drawing turns into a very real building like this elevated slab detail. Remember Ree's truck and needing to have provide her an accessible house? Well, by selecting an elevated slab, which is nothing new, it was just new to Rural Studio. By exploring this foundation, we were able to lower her house to about 16 inches above grade instead of about a pier on beam, pier and beam is about 36 inches above ground. So that means that we could get a very reasonable length ramp ramp under cover and get her to her front door faster. So um, yeah, and uh, stick, we usually build with uh, lumber and wood because it's a, in our area, it's a renewable resource, it's local and it's forgiving for our students. And probably the most basic construction system, which is a good foundation for young architects to learn to work with. So Re still parks as closely as she can, but now she has a ramp and a handrail to help her get into her house. And uh, you can see that Re's house is a version of Joanne's home, which is one of those product line houses. The Hill Trust makes it a little taller and uh, you can see, next slide, yep, yep, there we go. The Hild make, the Hild Trust make, the Hild Trust makes it a little bit taller and the porch is a little bit shallower so we could move the washer and dryer into the bathroom. But it's always a game of inches when modifying these pretty small houses. The latest house we just finished is one for Ophelia. Ophelia has lived in Newburn for more than 50 years. Um, and through drawing Ophelia's home, we learned some important things about her life. Uh, connectivity, which uh, which all of these satellite dishes and um, you know the history of connecting to the outside world is is drawn right here in this rendering, but it's important to her. Uh, we also learned that Ophelia likes to sleep in her living room, and there are several really good reasons for this. She likes to sleep with the TV on so she doesn't get lonely. And it means that one bedroom is open for her son. After her husband's passing a few years ago, uh, her son comes to stay with her sometimes and she wants him to have a place to stay. And we didn't know this when we uh, selected Ophelia. We probably would have still worked with her, but we I can only build one bedroom homes because of time and budget constraints. But we still wanted to accommodate this really important family unit. Um, so what we did was design a, what we call a quarter bedroom into Ophelia's house. So, you know, we learned the students study not only the outside of the house, but we look at all of the client's belongings and what they'll be bringing over to the new house. So we make the right selection. Site constraints are always important. You know, Ophelia lived on a third of an acre and it turned out we could only build her house on a third of that third of an acre because of power lines and septic and driveway. So these are all really very real things for young students to grapple with. Um, and in the end, another version of Joanne's home was the best fit for Ophelia. And you can see how the original house has been modified to include what we call the quarter bedroom. It's a small nook in the living room with its own storage. Ophelia puts her day bed in there and the bedroom is reserved for guests. Uh, for other clients, this space could be a home office, uh, extra storage or where a grandchild could sleep for an extended stay if necessary. Ophelia is very happy with her nook. She's moved into her house and she calls it her bedroom and the other one, her other bedroom. Um, so they're both her bedrooms, but she has two sleeping spaces. And we also provided an accessible entrance for Ophelia, of course. Um, but building iteratively is a luxury in an academic setting. So studying and comparing is a great way to learn about what works best. And Betsy, her, Betsy and her team take this concept even further. So I'm happy to be the teacher of the next generation of designers, builders, and architects. And we hope that this style of education will encourage them to be citizen architects throughout their career. As Emily mentioned, our students out in West Alabama have designed 25 pro over 25 prototypes in 17 years of study and research. 
And our team began to consider how we could extend the impact of this applied research in housing access and affordability beyond West Alabama. So we developed Rural Studios Housing Affordability Technical Assistance Program that we call the Front Porch Initiative. It's a faculty-led initiative where we offer housing products and technical assistance to housing providers working to deliver homes in their own often under-resourced communities. In our service area of West Alabama, Rural Studio works in a sort of mutual aid model where students design, build, and provide houses to local residents who wouldn't be able to afford a home under normal circumstances. And in turn, these owners act as clients, as Emily described, playing a pivotal role in our students' architectural education. The Front Porch team takes the knowledge and products developed over the years in West Alabama and offers it to housing provider partners outside our service area. Through their established delivery methods with contractors and maybe volunteers, these partners are able to offer the same energy efficient, resilient, and healthy homes to their clients. We view this collaboration between the two teams as a symbiotic relationship of information sharing. As Emily described, the students work to develop products and tailor them to a specific client. And at the same time, the Front Porch team works with housing policy stakeholders and a network of regional housing providers to advance equitable access to affordable housing. We then share the information learned, creating a constant feedback loop serving both groups. Each refines the other's efforts, yielding better products and technical assistance. The Front Porch Initiative takes one and two bedroom prototypes designed by student teams at Rural Studio and develops them into a product line of homes. Of the many prototypes developed at Rural Studio, we currently have five product line homes, each named for the first homeowner of that home. They are one and two bedroom homes that are small, but not tiny. They are designed to be as efficient and durable as possible, meet all conventional code and lending requirements, be titled as real property, and be lived in normally. Here we have Dave's house, Joanne's, MacArthur's, Buster's, and Sylvia's house. Through the Front Porch Initiative Technical Assistance Program, we share with our builder partners our knowledge on what to build relative to codes, universal design, lending and insurance requirements, and how they work together. And we synthesize this information tailored to the specific needs of a partner in a set of construction documents and specs that show not only how to build, but more importantly, relative to high performance standards, why to build that way. And over the years, our team has developed an instruction manual that helps our students and partners understand the hows and whys of high performance home building. Of note is the iterative nature of our process. Here are five versions of the same prototype built in Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee, illustrating the inherent flexibility of these products. They can meet a wide range, uh, they can be adapted to meet a wide range of sites, climactic conditions, and performance objectives as needed for each client's particular circumstances. And as part of our technical assistance program, we've developed a library of materials illustrating the range of variations possible. We understand how to design to a high standard of building performance and the impact different assemblies can have on that performance. Ultimately, we aim to study the relationship between high performance building and affordability and how one can affect the other. Affordable housing often focuses on lowering the initial construction cost to the detriment of building performance. We seek to find the balance point between the upfront cost of improved performance and the back end performance benefits or consequences. By investing in improved efficiency and durability in a healthier home, and in the surrounding community, can we lower the homeowner's energy bill and insurance premiums and reduce chronic illness? We're currently working with a network of housing providers across the Southeast in climate zones two, three, and four. The Front Porch Initiative provides the information, knowledge, and know-how to help our partners make informed decisions regarding both the quantitative and qualitative aspects of building performance so that they can provide high performance homes to their clients. Each house we build offers the opportunity to study different issues of efficiency, resilience, wellness, and community building. And I'll share briefly what this looks like on the ground, starting with one of our first projects outside West Alabama, a case study of two versions of the product line homes. With this, we'll explore the pluses and minuses of different building standards and their delivery, 
and talk about the intersection of energy efficiency and resilience. Auburn Opelika Habitat for Humanity is our local habitat affiliate with which we have a long history. These two houses were constructed via design build studios in a partnership between architecture and building science students who provided project research, design development, and volunteer construction labor as part of their coursework with a professional contractor acting as the project manager. These were both versions of the same two bedroom, one bath house built to different performance standards. In this aerial view, you can see the confluence of two street grids and the irregular parcels that result. The orange outlines show property lines for these two parcels that had remained un unutilized in the affiliate's portfolio for years. The affiliate was unable to utilize these parcels because their traditional three and four bedroom homes wouldn't fit on these irregular sites. The introduction of a smaller two bedroom home not only unlocked these and other parcels for the affiliate, building homes on these parcels increases property value and adds to the local tax base. The smaller prototype also expands the housing provider's client base. In addition to their energy and resilience performance, we believe that these homes strengthen their community, a less tangible measure of home performance. The site plan shows how the houses sit, fit on their sites within the tight object setbacks. House 66 at the top of the screen was built in 2018 and House 68 at the bottom of the screen in 2019. While each house was built to the fortified gold high wind resiliency standard, they were each built to a different energy efficiency standard. Quite often we talk about the added cost of increased performance. These studios took the opposite approach. They built to the highest standard, then applied the FIAS objectives like rigorous air sealing to the zero energy ready home in an effort to maintain a high level of performance while reducing costs. Developing a com comprehensive understanding of the more prescriptive FIAS standard was invaluable to us as we later built to the more descriptive zero energy ready standard. Under our direction, the students in these two design build studios took the prototype designed by rural studio students and adapted the assemblies to meet the respective building standards. And based on the experience of building the first home, the second studio analyzed material assemblies, components, detailing, and construction processes. And we identified five key areas where we thought we could reduce construction costs in the second home. Once the homes were complete, we installed circuit level monitoring equipment and we're tracking energy use to compare the performance of each home. Every month we download power consumption data and measure it against the model data. This graph tracks the energy required to heat, cool, ventilate, and dehumidify both houses. It's an example of how we utilize this fine grain data collection. Last summer, we noticed excessive power draw for a circuit at house 68. It turned out that a faulty humidistat had that dehumidifier running continuously for the months of May and June. Had we not been tracking detailed circuit level energy usage, we likely never would have caught it and learned to repair it. So this tool empowers the homeowner not only to use their house more efficiently and lower energy use, but also know when their systems are operating appropriately. Now collected one full year of comparative data for both houses, we've moved into a second year of data collection. Spikes in energy usage can be attributed to that faulty humanostat, which broke after we fixed it, and to the stay-at-home order for the pandemic. We do have a data dap, gap in data for house 68 due to a power outage sending the monitoring system offline. So we use this data to explore a number of research questions. We're comparing construction costs between the two houses and evaluating how differences in construction affect operating costs for the homeowners. We're continuing our research on how actual energy consumption differs from predicted use and how heat transfers through key locations in the assemblies. And based on our preliminary findings, the zero energy ready home is performing comparably to the FIAS home. Taken over the life of the mortgage, the higher cost of construction does not bear out in comparable energy savings. And this comparable energy performance is in large part due to the construction means and methods that we learned while building the VS home and now apply to all our homes, regardless of the standards to which we build. The experience of building and monitoring these houses has also helped us shape our process with other partners. Our process involves extensive energy modeling during design to optimize assemblies and details and to ensure each design meets or exceeds its energy standard. In the Opelika homes, we modeled both homes in Woofie since it was required for the FIAS process and since it provided a more detailed view of energy consumption categories. Since the volume of our homes are small relative to their exterior surface area, we used a beta version of Woofie that took this into account. And with subsequent partners, we model each iteration in Ecotrope. So we don't have quite the same level of detail uh, relative to the categories. 
particularly HVAC energy consumption, but it does allow us to size equipment properly and estimate a HERS index. Second, as building construction progressed, we tested the project's performance to confirm that it was meeting the air tightness goals of the energy modeling. We performed a blower door test at three stages, when the framing, sheathing, windows and doors were in, after insulating, and at completion of construction. This allowed us to course correct after each stage of construction. We also found the blower door test to be a powerful teaching tool, a tangible method for demonstrating building science principles to students, and as we'll discuss later, contractors. Third, for each home, we sought verification of performance through third party certification. These certifications can help housing providers prove to project sponsors that performance criteria have been met. They can provide documentation to homeowners for incentives like tax credits, and they can equip appraisers with tools to appropriately value the home. However, for housing providers unfamiliar with Beyond Code certification, it's key to communicate the sequencing of field verification through the development and construction process. In fact, a miscommunication of required field verification cost us our chance to achieve zero energy ready certification at house 68. Once the homes are occupied, we monitor energy use remotely and track uh, actual energy performance compared to consumption predicted by the energy models. The knowledge we've gained from this iterative process informs our ongoing work and helps our housing partners make better informed decisions about the Beyond Code standards they may pursue, as well as the construction processes necessary to maximize these standards. So now I'll share a few of our lessons learned with field test partners through this process. We previously showed a graph comparing House 66 and House 68 energy consumption. In contrast, these graphs show modeled versus actual for the first house. The goal of energy efficiency measures is, of course, to reduce overall consumption but it also helps smooth out the variability of energy use month to month by reducing the peaks in the hottest and coldest months of the year. This helps our homeowners have more predictable energy bills. You can see from this graph that our model energy use is a bit flatter than our actual energy use. So we, we know we still have some work to do there. Wolfie provides predicted estimates for seven areas of energy use. To simplify, we've grouped these into three categories. Our first category at the top includes energy required to heat, cool, ventilate, and dehumidify the home. And this usage is largely envelope driven. We are encouraged that our actual consumption is track, tracking relatively close to the predicted use. By comparison, our plug loads vary widely from the model predictions. Since these are occupant driven, this observation suggests an opportunity to share this data with the homeowner may help them make better informed decisions about energy usage. It also calls into question whether the modeled assumptions are, correct, are accurate and whether we should adjust them moving forward. In Nashville, we've completed four uh, one-bedroom homes in partnership with an affordable housing provider who utilized a for-profit contractor to construct the project. And we provided technical assistance to the contractor throughout construction on all aspects of home performance. These homes utilized a detached duplex zoning, which allowed us to build four homes with four separate real property homeowners on just two small narrow lots. And the homes are arranged in such a way as to provide front yards, off street parking, and a shared common courtyard space seen here. These homes aren't built to any VOD code standards. In fact, the adopted code at permitting was 2012 IRC, but with 2009 IECC R values and area infiltration numbers, seven ACH 50 for climate zone four. Because Nashville was preparing to adopt 2018 IRC and ICC, the contractor was interested in trying to meet our modeled goal of three ACH 50, which is the 2018 requirement for climate zone four. So it's part of our technical assistance. We pursue a HER certificate on all our houses. And based on our experience with the Leica houses, we conduct a blower door test with all our partners at the HERS Raiders pre jet board inspection, although it's not required for certification. We utilized this initial blower door test in the Nashville project, not as a test of performance, but rather as a tool to help the contractor quantitatively understand the impact of doing things right and to communicate with the subcontractors early in the construction process of what doing things right really means. By engaging the contractor directly with the energy consultant and hers rater and evaluating building performance at several key moments during construction, we were almost able to meet 2018 energy code expectations while utilizing 2012 energy code requirements for construction. This was an important learning opportunity for everyone involved as the impact of doing things right or otherwise focusing on construction means and methods. And not just on the utilization of advanced materials and assemblies, 
is key to increasing building performance without increasing construction costs. Moving down to the Florida Panhandle, we're continuing this type of technical assistance and learning, and we have the first of two, uh, first two of four infill houses under construction with a local Habitat affiliate who was particularly drawn to our houses due to the narrow lots and slope of the parcel. Their standard three bedroom house was unable to navigate the sloping site. But these houses are inherently flexible and can accommodate a range of sites and climate zones. So we're in the process of building two two bedroom and two one bedroom homes. This project is also important as we've been able to add a small local college's new construction workforce development program to address the much needed workforce piece of the housing affordability puzzle. This project works to respond to a number of different challenges that we find in many areas, and it illustrates the multidimensional response to housing affordability. And much like the Opelika houses, these are being built to multiple beyond code standards. They're located in a rural area, and many of their certifying agents are driving at least an hour to get to the project site. The nearest Energy Star certified HVAC installer was an hour away, and they quoted the affiliate a price 50% higher than their local HVAC installer had quoted for an equivalent system. This was gonna be cost prohibitive for the affiliate, but our Energy Star consultant pointed out that since we're using a packaged ductless mini split system in the house, we were exempt from the need for a certified installer. In this instance, mechanical system selection will facilitate the housing provider's ability to achieve verification of the home's performance. At a minimum, this will unlock funding for the Habitat affiliate. It also has the potential to boost the home's appraised value and possibly provide a tax credit for the homeowner. And since we're talking about HVAC systems in these houses, here's a quick view of something we've learned. Um, this, something we're studying is a direct result of the post-occupancy monitoring in Opelika. We used eight ERVs to supply fresh air to the bedrooms and exhaust stale air from the living area and bathroom in those two houses. However, we realized that this created positive pressure in the bedrooms and readings showed elevated temperature and humidity levels in these spaces. Because the conditioning system is located in the living room, the positive pressure prevented the tempered air from migrating into the bedrooms. So moving forward, we've revised the ERV duct layout so that the fresh air is supplied in the living room and the stale air is exhausted from the bedrooms. This creates negative pressure in the bedrooms, which we predict will help pull the conditioned air through the house and into these spaces. And we will learn soon when we um, install our monitoring equipment in Nashville. Lastly, we've learned that a bit of planning early on can simplify energy monitoring in the post-occupancy phase. Most HVAC equipment and large appliances are already on dedicated circuits, but by asking the electrician to separate different systems, like separating lighting and receptacles onto different circuits, the data collected can be more useful with minimal added cost. And that's one of the biggest takeaways for this work. Means and methods can have large impacts, either positive or negative, at minimal cost. Do sweat the small stuff. This collaboration between the Rural Studio Academic Programs and the Front Porch Initiative has formalized a process that enhances our work. It makes the student work more intentional because they know their efforts feed back into the larger research initiative. Through this shared process, we aim to understand how the work can be more broadly meaningful and impactful at both local and regional scale. Thanks so much for your time tonight. We look forward to your questions and please feel free to reach out to us if anyone has questions or um, any more details about our work. And if you ever find yourself in lower Alabama, swing by and come visit.